Chief Executive of Canterbury's Women's Refuge, Annette Gillespie, has also seen an influx of women to contact and check up on from the police. Our role with the police is to contact every woman that's uh, named on a police incident report. In normal times, without earthquake, there are approximately 600 per month, and then following the earthquake, there's been an increase on that. Annette Gillespie says those who had previously experienced violence in the home were now more vulnerable than they have ever been. Prior to the earthquake they may have had safety plans which include having their doors locked, having windows bolted so that offenders can't get to them. After the earthquake they may not have windows in their houses or they may not have doors on their houses and in some cases sometimes they don't have parts of the wall on their houses so they're easily accessible to an offender who might want to cause harm. Police spokesperson Andrew McCulley says they are disgusted with the increase and are concerned about the outcome. What we're concerned about is we were very fortunate that we didn't have a fatality during the quake or the um, ensuing aftershocks. So we'd hate to see anybody uh, you know, hurt or even worse through um, avoidable circumstances. Trauma counsellor Chris Height says it's not unusual to have an increase after a natural disaster with stress, anger and frustration playing a huge part. Because if people are not coping, like if you've lost everything and you've got no insurance or you've lost, you've lost your home and now you've lost your job because the business has collapsed, often a one partner, and unfortunately, generally men, but not exclusively, some women as well, the only way that they can cope with that is by being angry. And so th they lash out. Annette Gillespie agrees. She says international research sadly indicates an increase in domestic violence after a natural disaster. Very stressful time following a natural disaster. So it's not unexpected that there would be more family conflict. But in the context of family violence, it's about one person needing control over other people in their family. A raft of support agencies have been brought in by government departments to help those deal with their bottled up emotions in a way that doesn't affect the family. So what's happening at the moment is that the, the word today was that domestic violence has doubled in the Canterbury area and they're flying more counsellors down from, from out of the area. Chris Hyde is concerned about the rapid rate at which domestic violence is rearing its head. Anger is part of the grief process for loss and it usually gets projected somewhere. So, unfortunately, we're seeing it quite quickly. And Women's Refuge are feeling the rapid heat, with more staff being appointed to help. The Army and police from all over New Zealand have been monitoring suburban streets to keep an eye out for unnecessary behaviour, related and unrelated to domestic violence, so far with a good response from the community. Grace Cocker for In Focus. And Grace joins me now live in the studio. Grace... Uh, the, the, the Women's Refuge, uh, how is it dealing with, with the increase that they've been seeing? Well, the Refuge has been helping out at welfare centres um, throughout Canterbury. Therefore, they've had to bring in more staff who are therefore working more hours. Um, this is financially taking a toll on the Refuge, but Annette Gillespie has been informed that the government is setting up a fund for them to apply to so that they can get you know more funding um, and more financial aid. Um, so therefore they can start helping those people in need and keep up their safe houses and keep up their aid in the welfare centres. Keep, and so, you know, so keep it going. Is it only domestic violence that's been on the increase? Well, that's what I initially thought. Um, Andrew McCulley from the police has said that there was a small increase post-quake. However, it just brought them back to the general offending levels prior to the earthquake. Um, the perception of a mini crime wave being broadcast by a lot of the media is not entirely correct. Um, they've had army, police and navy personnel from all over New Zealand patrolling Christchurch suburbs and they've all noted a decrease in people taking advantage of the vulnerable situation as there's just too many people out there so it's too much of a risk. <coughs> Following the passing of the Canterbury Earthquake Response and Recovery Bill late, late last night in Parliament, the Government and Christchurch City Council now have more control than ever over a quake-stricken region. And with their newfound control, what's their vision for the new face of Christchurch and who's paying what? Look, it's really obvious that our fighting fund, as it stands at the moment, is just like a, a pea in an ocean. It's not going to make a hell of a lot of difference to the tide level, unfortunately. 
The fighting fund Mayor Bob Parker talks about is the $11 million already earmarked for building repairs in the Christchurch area. But I'm looking for more funding and more leverage and if we're really going to be successful in helping particularly small business owners, people who own uh, properties where it's poised between do I demolish or do I go forward and do something to restore and retain this piece of heritage, our desire is that you err to the going forward and retaining the heritage. Now, more than 10 days after the quake, it's the future face of a partially crumbled city, which is the council's concern. We've sat down and uh, with the New Zealand Institute of Architects and we uh, are very, very anxious to put together a team of people to help us transition out of the place we are in now and take the city forward, improve the city and have streetscapes that relate to the existing streetscapes that have survived and the ones that we'll ensure survive in the weeks and months ahead. Building survival has been the hot topic of the week, with the council urging historic and character building owners to save their properties as much as possible. The heritage and character fabric is precious to Christchurch. It is part of our look and feel. It is part of the Garden City image. That's Councillor Sue Wells, Chairman of the CCC's Regulatory and Planning Committee. On Monday evening, she put a red sticker on demolition, warning historic building owners there'd be consequences for hasty choices. The council will not tolerate buildings being demolished without consent. If you have a building that you think is in need of demolition, you must contact the council and you must get consent because if not, you are not likely to be insured and you're also likely to be in breach of a few bits of legislation. We really don't want that to happen. But what they do want to happen is see the streamlined benefits of the empowering bill merging some aspects of building consent and resource consent together, which Parliament passed into law late last night. We expect that that legislation will tie those two things together more coherently than they currently are. So if you have a building which is absolutely beyond repair and it is a listed heritage building, the two processes will merge seamlessly. To help facilitate the process for building owners, the Building Recovery Office in Hereford Street is the designated new service, which has so far seen just under 100 owners. Help from the office includes access to property records, consent forms, engineering and architectural advice and funding, which Sue Wells is optimistic about. And it won't necessarily be grants, we haven't talked this through yet, it might be. Equally it might be suspensory loans, it might be that we look at building um, development contributions policy, rates remissions, there's a whole big conversation we need to have. Big conversations which will be happening for months. The Canterbury Earthquake Response and Recovery Bill won't expire for at least another year and complete recovery building for Canterbury will certainly take even longer. Jennifer Savage, In Focus. Now apart from the obvious, the violent shaking and chaos in your home, how did Cantabrians know exactly what it was that had happened? Well, that's where the media comes in. Willie Nichols investigates how the media covered the Canterbury earthquake as it happened and where the stories are going from here. With ongoing coverage of the Christchurch earthquake, this is News Talk ZB. I'd been in a really deep sleep, it had been my birthday the night before. Then I got a call from my manager, Tim Dyer, who said the building next to Radio Network House uh, had collapsed. It was a hectic morning and Newstalk ZB's Mike Yardley was just one of many journalists and media organisations all over the country scrambling to get involved in what is being called New Zealand's biggest news event. So when the earth shuddered, how did the media respond? Radio was first on the air with frantic calls to stations within minutes. Those without all-night hosts then faced a mad rush to go live and Mike Yardy recalls it vividly. It was dark, it was choked with dust, there was concrete debris and plaster just splattered all over the stairs. It was a real sense of danger um, as well as adrenaline that was kicking in as we made our way up to the studio to get on air and to tell the world what was happening. Before the sun was up, print journalists were out on the streets and began updating various news websites. CNN and BBC World had the story before many Kiwis outside the mainland even knew of the quake themselves. 
TV was next to click into gear, but unlike flicking a switch and going straight on, the two major networks faced some logistical nightmares. On Radio New Zealand's Media Watch on Sunday, TVNZ's One News editor Paul Patrick explained why they weren't up and running until two and a half hours after the quake. Television network is at six o'clock um, on a Saturday morning is a dormant thing. As soon as we had a full studio going and as soon as we believed that we had uh, enough content to sustain full coverage, then we flicked the switch and we went continuous. TV3 was even later as energy supply troubles rendered them powerless, as it were, until 2 in the afternoon. But media commentator Jim Tully believes speed wasn't TV's only fault. TV networks were sort of um, driven as they are to some extent by ratings seem to make it dramatic rather than necessarily as um, as informative as we were getting from, from newspapers and radio. However, social media was possibly the quickest of them all. Trade Me recorded its first post only five minutes after the quake. <laughs> Both Telecom and Vodafone confirmed an explosion of texts right after the earthquake struck. Although Jim Tully says social media bought more than just immediacy. I think we've seen social media uh, come into their own. We've had images and, uh, and descriptions of events and comments from a whole range of people which has widened the lens in terms of people who have been able to uh, contribute. However, with Dallow and McRoberts no longer live from Christchurch and the front page is beginning to move away from the earthquake, where will the story go now? I think one of the big debates Christchurch is waking up to now is what face do we want the city to have in the wake of a lot of the buildings that are going to come down. What impact it's going to have on the local body election I think is a big unknown. What is known is that this story will continue for a fair while yet. Willie Nichols for In Focus. And Willie joins me now live in the studio to help us understand that. Willie, you say the story will continue. Uh, where do you see the coverage going from here? Yeah, well, I've got uh, this morning's press with me here, and uh, bang, contrary to one of my lines in the story, they've actually given the whole front page to the earthquake with both stories, as you can see here, looking at the rebuilding process. However, over on Stuff, which is the online newspaper, there's just a small story there on the page about the state of emergency being extended, whereas further in the week, that whole page on the homepage was absolutely covered with it. So I think nationally, the story's possibly starting to slink away a little, but those little sh aftershocks like last night will probably give it a bit of an extended life. Um, I think we'll start to see a lot more personal, feel-good stories coming out regionally, and no doubt the rebuilding process will be monitored closely by the media. I mean, I was even just talking with Mike Yardley yesterday, and he mentioned the fact that there's still over 300 animals missing in the city, which I think is a bit of an untold story. That's great, Willie. Uh, while you're here, I'll just ask you this quick one. On Friday, as uh, per usual, you'll be bringing us your weekly edition of As the City Sleeps. What's coming up this Friday? Yeah, well, I'm, ta I'm taking a look at those suffering from sleep problems. Now, this has probably become a lot more relevant lately with the earthquake uh, happening in the middle of the night. So I've been chatting with Dr Alex Bartle from the Sleep Well Clinic in Christchurch, and there'll be tips on how to pick if a friend or yourself are suffering from a sleeping disorder, as well as a few remedies to help you get your 40 winks back. So if you're listening out there, well, you're, you're probably sleeping now if you are suffering from a sleep disorder, uh, get in contact with Mo because I'd love to talk to you. Cheers, Willie. You have a good one. And that's all that we've got for you for today's show. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be right back here with the next edition of In Focus, Midday Friday, right here on Mode 96.1. Don't forget, you can catch us online. Join our Facebook page by clicking the link on the Mode website. That's moderadio.co.nz. I'm Sam Mulgrew, and that's In Focus, bringing your news into focus. Mode 96.1.